Hi, my name is David Siegel. I wrote my first book on climate change in 1991. I've made movies, videos, and I write a weekly climate blog. After the first version of this video, I got really good feedback and decided to make some changes, mostly for clarity, and a new section on the history of CO2. This is an entire semester on climate change in just 40 minutes, so please pay attention. You've heard that CO2 is causing our climate to change, but is that true? I claim it isn't. I claim you're not being told the truth. I'll present my case in five main chapters. But to start, what is climate? Here's a graph of temperatures from the U.S. Historical Climate Network. Notice two things. Over 130 years, we saw New Hampshire temperatures have risen about 2 degrees Fahrenheit, a bit more than 1 degree Celsius. This isn't too different from many other places. No one really argues about this. What else do you notice? 10 years isn't enough to discern a trend. You might think you see a trend, only for it to reverse or wash out over the next 10 years. Here you can see three 30-year periods where the climate warmed, then cooled, then warmed again. 30 years is generally accepted as the minimum for discerning a climate change. Everything else is weather. Most people think carbon dioxide is heating the planet and will cause more climate change. So let's look at the history of carbon dioxide for the last four and a half billion years. For the first billion years, the Earth was a hot sea of molten rock and volcanoes, which eventually produced a lot of carbon dioxide in the air. I just want to focus on the CO2, which peaked between 30 and 40% around three billion years ago. I can believe that figure. Both Mars and Venus have atmospheres of 95% carbon dioxide. So what happened? Something removed the carbon and left the oxygen. Can you see that? Where did all the carbon go? What can turn carbon dioxide into oxygen? Well, plants can. Plants take in sunlight and CO2 and release oxygen. These are phytoplankton and algae in the ocean. They are turning sunlight into oxygen and keeping the carbon in the form of carbohydrates. And then they get eaten by tiny creatures called zooplankton which combine carbon and calcium to make shells. So after a few billion years of shell making, we get a lot of carbon on the bottom of the ocean. And we have a word for that. It's called Europe and the Middle East. You could be sitting on that carbon right now. It's locked up in limestone, calcium carbonate, which is distributed all around the world. And in Europe, it's kilometers thick. It's made of the tiny creatures that ate the plants that changed the carbon dioxide to oxygen. You're literally looking at two billion years of shell making. And that's how our atmosphere got where it is today. 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% other gases. More carbon dioxide leads to more shell making, not ocean acidification. CO2 spent three billion years well over 1%, and the last one billion years under 1%. We're now at four tenths of 1% carbon dioxide. Oh wait, did I say four tenths? No. No, we're now at four one hundredths of 1% carbon dioxide. And this is what some people are very worried about. Four one hundredths of 1%. I hope this helps put things in perspective. We know temperatures are going up, but they might not be going up as much as you think or for the reasons you think. In this chapter, we'll learn about the relationship between the orbits of the planets and temperature, and we'll see how people use temperature data to drive a story of global warming. 550 million years ago, the Earth's atmosphere had about 7 tenths of 1% CO2. That's 7,000 parts per million. This is during the Cambrian explosion when many plants and new life forms flourished. And then CO2 went down. Only twice in this period has CO2 been as low as it is now. Look at this graph. Do you think CO2 is driving temperature? If the IPCC is right about CO2, then the high CO2 regimes we've seen in the past should have ended in a permanently hot Earth. Instead, whenever temperatures become too extreme, they go back toward the middle. Some people would call that feedback. 
but I want to replace that concept with a new idea. The path you see here in red is driven by the mechanics of the Earth orbiting the Sun. Let's look a bit closer. At the scale of 400,000 years, we see the cyclical effect of orbital mechanics. The Sun's influence changes as the Earth's axis tilts and wobbles. Note that temperature in red almost always moves first, while CO2 moves later. CO2 comes out of or goes into the oceans over decades as a result of Henry's Law, which says that a warmer ocean will outgas CO2, and as the oceans cool, they absorb CO2. Also notice the sawtooth pattern. Temperatures naturally go up quickly and down more slowly. Now let's look at the cycles. The most influential cycle is the precession cycle of about 26,000 years. That's the low-level jaggedness you see here. We can also see what looks like a regular pattern about every 100,000 years or so, which is the precession modified by the other two main cycles, obliquity and eccentricity. During this period, the shapes of the continents haven't changed much, so temperature cycles are driven almost entirely by orbital mechanics. The Sun also drifts up and down in the galactic plane as it makes its way around the center of the galaxy, exposing the Earth to more or fewer cosmic rays, and that has a direct impact on our climate. And so do sunspots. And so does Jupiter's orbit. It's complicated, and we haven't figured it all out yet. There are smaller cycles, larger cycles, and sometimes missing cycles. I want you to see this graph of temperature as a time recording of the positions of the Earth, the Sun, and the continents. There is no Mother Nature trying to take care of us. The Earth is not trying to return to center. There is no center. The Earth is not in balance in some magical way that's good for life. The Earth is just a ball of rock spinning around a star. There are feedbacks, both positive and negative. For example, when the Earth cools, there's more snow, and that reflects more sunlight, cooling the Earth further. But when the Earth gets close to the Sun, all that works in reverse, and the feedback warms the Earth. At the equator, when the water heats up, it causes evaporation in clouds, reflecting sunlight and cooling the surface. High, wispy cirrus clouds are made of ice crystals, which emit very little infrared radiation to space, so they tend to warm the atmosphere. Lower clouds, which are made of liquid water droplets, have a strong cooling effect in daytime, but a warming effect at night. Most feedbacks occur over hours, days, and weeks. They don't affect climate. Let's look at the last 20,000 years. Again, temperatures go up faster than they go down, and CO2 lags behind temperature. 8,000 years ago, temperatures were a bit higher. There was no ice at the North Pole during summer. Sea levels were one to two meters higher than today, and polar bears survived for thousands of years without ice in summer. Look at how stable temperatures are now on a macro level. No climate scientist on Earth can explain this graph. There's still much we don't know. Look at some of these heating events over the last 50,000 years. The vertical lines are called the Dansgaard Oeschger events. And in some of them, the Earth's temperature went up by as much as five degrees over less than a century. Remember this the next time someone tells you, this time it's different. This time, it's the rate of change that's so scary. No, no it isn't. Some of these events make today's rise look tame by comparison. There are many of them, and they weren't driven by any kind of rise in carbon dioxide. Looking at the last 2,000 years, we see the Roman and medieval warm periods, which were roughly on par with the warming we have today. We have peer-reviewed studies showing that the medieval warm period extended to China, Australia, and many areas outside of Europe. We have peer-reviewed studies showing that this is driven mostly by changes in incoming solar radiation, and certainly it wasn't about CO2 back then. Note the rate of increase is roughly the same for both warming regimes. The slope of that line is about 0.8 degrees Celsius per 100 years. Beginning in 1350, temperatures started dropping and notice they go down more slowly, but it became much colder. Greenland and its farms had to be abandoned. Vineyards throughout Northern Europe disappeared. And between 1607 and 1814, it was not uncommon for the River Thames to freeze up for up to two months at a time. 
There were football pitches, bowling matches, fruit sellers, shoemakers, printers, booksellers, barbers, even a pub or two, and it all stopped in 1814. Now we know why this happened and I'm going to explain it in the next chapter. I want to show you data from Berkeley Earth, which has become the gold standard created by a guru named Zeke Housefather, who refuses to debate anyone on his methods. In fact, a group he's part of, Climate Feedback, is in charge of climate censorship for the big social media platforms Facebook and LinkedIn, and they make very good money censoring and kicking people off those platforms. People like me. Zeke has magically erased the hot 1930s, and he shows a steady upward trend for the last 50 years. At least half of his data is fabricated to show people what they want to see. Let's check some other sources. This graph shows data from a remote Iceland station since 1800. It's one of the longest running temperature records in the world that hasn't been influenced by urbanization. Look at the y-axis. 1.6 degrees of warming in 200 years. That's 0.8 degrees per century. This is about as good a proxy for global temperatures as you'll find. Even in Iceland, the 1930s and 40s were almost as hot as temperatures are now. Let's look at some United States raw data and see if it corresponds with the Berkeley Earth chart. Here we see maximum temperatures only for the contiguous US. We know nighttime temperatures, those are the minimum temperatures, are rising because of cities, roads, concrete, and the built environment. So this is maxima only. Instead of adjusting for the time of day, which is what NASA and Berkeley Earth do, this graph shows raw, unadjusted thermometer data from stations that reset their thermometers in the mornings. It shows that the 1930s were very hot in the US, and this graph is driven more by the El Nino and La Nina cycles than anything else. Here are all the stations that adjust in the afternoons. They run about two degrees warmer, but by not adjusting and filling in temperatures, as Berkeley Earth does, just by separating like with like and looking at raw data, you get a different picture. Now let's look at some more raw data from the United States, courtesy of Tony Heller. This is actual thermometer data from the station at Cooperstown, New York since 1892. Do you see a trend that corresponds to the CO2 level? Notice that 1936 is the hottest year so far. Here's Michigan since 1896. Again, the hottest year is 1936. Indiana since 1895. The hottest year? 1936. Nevada, 1888. The hottest year on this thermometer is 1933. New Jersey, 1877. 1918 is their hottest year. California since 1896, where the hottest year was clearly 1969. Now there might be an upward trend if you squint hard. So remember, anytime you see graphs that are off the charts, it might be the charts that are off, not the data. This is weather balloon temperature data since 1979. It shows more warming in the northern hemisphere and negligible amount of warming in the tropics, which makes sense since the Arctic has been warming, but other parts of the world haven't. Taken together, they represent one degree of warming in 40 years. Neither of these graphs shows any acceleration upward, even though CO2 has increased dramatically during this time. I want to show you a trick NASA uses to scare people. They show the top graph in red to make it look scary, but the y-axis only has three and a half degrees and they use Fahrenheit so they can show more degrees, magnifying what is really a tiny amount of warming. Below you see exactly the same data, but with a range of temperatures you'll find in a typical town from one season to the next, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. This graph shows the same thing every other graph shows, about 0.8 degrees Celsius of warming per century for the last 150 years with no acceleration. Media companies prefer the top chart. By combining it with scary headlines and images of disasters, they get more traffic and sell more advertising. John Robson has a series of images where he asks people to tell the difference between 1920 and 2020. This is raw thermometer data from a rural station in Australia. Can you tell which of these is 1920 and which is 2020? Oh wait, isn't CO2 supposed to be global? Contrary to what you may have heard, 
No scientist in the world has yet found a clear signal that humans have had any effect on global climate. There are different arguments for various interpretations of thermometer data in the past. It's harder than you think. But since 1980, we have better data from satellites. Satellite data is the best way to measure temperature, and UAH has the best satellite data. It shows half a degree of warming in 40 years, roughly what I've been saying. Now let's look at the cause. We hear over and over that changes in the CO2 concentration are causing our climate to change. In this chapter, we'll learn what the greenhouse effect really is and how little influence it will have on our future temperature. This is an approximation of the energy budget under mostly clear skies. It's what scientists call the emissions equilibrium, where energy coming in must equal energy going out. So what exactly is the greenhouse effect? In yellow, we see incoming solar radiation, called shortwave radiation. But when it touches something, it heats that thing, and hot things emit infrared radiation, infrared photons, which travel at the speed of light in all directions. About 10% radiate back out to space. The rest of the photons take a much more roundabout route via the lower atmosphere. Waiting for that outgoing energy are the greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases cannot trap heat. Contrary to what Al Gore believes, they don't act like a blanket. They can't store heat. Greenhouse gases don't exactly reflect heat. They absorb and re-radiate it very quickly, sort of like the bumpers in a pinball machine. This happens at the speed of light, so the average infrared photon gets absorbed and re-radiated about a billion times a second, sometimes traveling as far as 100 meters until it hits the next greenhouse gas molecule and changes direction again. Eventually, all of this energy raises the equilibrium temperature of the atmosphere before it gets radiated out to space. In the troposphere, which goes up to about 10 to 12 kilometers, greenhouse gas molecules radiate heat in all directions. Once the radiation gets to the stratosphere, those same greenhouse gas molecules are farther apart. They tend to push the heat out to space more than back down. On the Antarctic Plateau, the greenhouse effect works in reverse. The inversion conditions in Antarctica cause greenhouse gases to help radiate heat directly to space, cooling the Earth. It's like there's no troposphere in Antarctica most of the time. Now, the Earth is 33 degrees Celsius warmer than it would be with no greenhouse gases. So let's see if we can add those degrees up. To do that, we use a visual representation of the Stefan-Boltzmann equations that govern the greenhouse effect. The x-axis shows long wavelengths on the left to short wavelengths on the right. The smooth blue line at the top represents energy escaping to space. Greenhouse molecules block that escape by forcing the energy to bounce around, raising the equilibrium temperature before that heat eventually escapes to space. I want you to imagine you're standing down on the x-axis, looking up, and you want to see how much heat energy gets intercepted on its way to space. The first thing I'll add is water vapor. Here's how much outgoing long wave radiation it intercepts. Water vapor adds around 25 degrees Celsius to the equilibrium temperature, so water vapor really does a lot of the work. Now I'll add ozone, which blocks a bit, maybe two to three degrees, depending on latitude and altitude. Now I've added 50 parts per million CO2. This is in the 12 to 18 micron range, which is the main part of the spectrum CO2 effects. The first 50 parts per million are tremendously powerful as a greenhouse gas. This adds probably another four to five degrees to the equilibrium temperature. It's up there right now, helping keep the earth about four or five degrees warmer than it would be if we had no CO2. Now I'm going to double the CO2 concentration three times from 50 to 400 parts per million. And look at all that energy intercepted. Did you see it? Maybe another degree or two for an 8x increase. Today, we're at 400 parts per million, and you're looking at 33 degrees of equilibrium temperature right there, mostly from water vapor, but also significantly from the first 50 parts of CO2 and ozone. Now, I'm going to do something that would cause everyone at the New York Times to fall over gasping for air. I'm going to double CO2 again, and let's see how much warming we get. Ready? That's it. I had to make it pink so you could see it. We're looking at around one degree of warming, maybe a bit less, and that's doubling CO2 to 800 parts per million, which is less than goes into greenhouses 
to help your tomatoes grow. To do that, to reach 800 parts per million, we'd have to burn about three times more fossil fuel than we've ever burned. It would take at least 100 years and maybe it would add one degree, probably less. That's because, as we've seen, CO2 is nearly saturated as a greenhouse gas already. What about methane? Molecule for molecule, methane is 30 times more potent than CO2. Right now, there are 1.8 parts per million of methane at ground level. So let's add that in. I made it red so you could see it. Notice it's pretty much covered by water vapor already, so it isn't really that effective. Contrary to what you've heard, methane isn't raising the equilibrium temperature very much. At our current rate of producing methane, it would take about 300 years to double it. But let's double it anyway and see what happens. Well, it's there, but you have to look closely. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back and forth so you can see those little red pixels. Can you see them now? Methane, CH4, which is measured in parts per billion, is so rare that doubling the amount would raise the equilibrium temperature about 0 0.012 degrees Celsius. Even 10 times more methane wouldn't change our climate noticeably. The only way you could convince people to stop adding methane to the atmosphere would be to lie. You'd tell them it's a potent greenhouse gas, which is true, and you would not tell them that adding even 10 times more methane would have virtually no effect on our climate. All climate scientists know this, but many would lose their jobs if they said it, because that's not the story people want to hear. Everything I've just said is in the IPCC reports. Here's a calculation using the IPCC's own formula for CO2. The first 50 parts per million do most of the work. Going from 50 to 100 parts per million changes the equilibrium temperature by one degree. Then it takes another doubling to warm another one degree, and then another doubling for the next degree. By now, we're on the flat part of the curve. The IPCC acknowledges this, but then they claim that feedback will cause water vapor and other things to wreck the earth unless we decarbonize. What about feedback? Well, we've already seen that at climate timescales, there really isn't any feedback. It's driven by orbital mechanics and plate tectonics. In this chapter, we'll learn how solar energy going into the oceans is what really drives our climate, separate from the weak greenhouse effect. Here's a rendering of the Earth 100 million years ago created by Christopher Scotese of the University of Texas. We see Africa and South America splitting up and a lot of land at the South Pole. The North Pole is covered by land and shallow seas. You can see Australia to the right and India is just starting to head north. 60 million years ago, the Atlantic Ocean is starting to open. We can see India racing toward Asia. The water circulates mostly around the mid latitudes from east to west. The Earth was very hot then, around 15 degrees hotter than today, because the equatorial heat had no way to escape via the poles. It was trapped. At this time, the Earth was probably covered maximally with clouds. The atmosphere would have been almost entirely saturated with water vapor everywhere, though there were probably some very hot deserts. Even though Antarctica was at the South Pole, it had a very warm tropical climate and was covered with palm trees. 30 million years later, India has smashed into Asia, creating the Himalayas, and the Isthmus of Panama has recently closed, opening the north-south channels that transport heat from the tropics to the poles. You would think this would warm the poles, but now the heat has a path to escape, and that brings colder temperatures to the poles, so they begin to freeze. By now, Australia has separated from Antarctica, so now the Southern Ocean begins, an east to west flow of cold water that surrounds and isolates the continent. Over the next 30 million years, the planet cools dramatically. Ice builds up on the Antarctic Plateau. Today, the North Pole is five kilometers of cold deep water surrounded by land, and the South Pole is a high mountain plateau covered in two kilometers of ice surrounded by water. They are very different. For the most part, Antarctica doesn't really interact much with the rest of the world. Most of the heat moves north, and this is why Europe is so warm, even though it's at the latitude of Canada. The second type of equilibrium is what I'd call thermal equilibrium. It's the story of heat transport from the tropics to the poles. The sun is extremely strong, sending huge amounts of energy to the Earth each day. 
above and below the mid-latitudes, much of it bounces off the surface to space. Some of it gets slowed down by greenhouse gases, as we've seen, but in the tropics, sunlight also penetrates below the surface and goes into the oceans. As the sunlight goes down into the water, it heats up lower layers, and a small fraction of that heat gets driven down into the mid-layer of the ocean, where it goes into currents. Even though it's a small percentage of incoming radiation, it's a huge amount of energy going into the oceans every day, and that amount is determined by the distance and angle of the sun. Ocean currents are complex. Oceans can store a tremendous amount of heat in the middle and deep layers, and the trade winds distribute that heat around the globe. It can resurface years or decades later. This is not feedback, this is thermal transport. And it's driven by the ITCZ, the Intertropical Convergence Zone, which defines the tropics and creates the weather and pressure patterns in each hemisphere. The ITCZ changes according to the solar pattern and the layout of the continents. If this is the first time you've heard about the ITCZ, this is the first day you've started to learn about climate change. Over the past 1,200 years, we see the ITCZ moving north and south in response to solar radiation from the orbital cycles. I want to show you how this works. Look at the medieval warm period. See how the ITCZ is high during this time? Jim Steele shows that when the ITCZ is more north as it was during the medieval warm period and is today, the eastern point of South America sends most of the incoming warm water northward to the North Atlantic. This is the period we're in now. When the ITCZ is south, less warm water goes north and more heads southward. Something similar happens in the Pacific. During the Little Ice Age, the ITCZ was in the south. This caused a tremendous buildup of ice in the Arctic. More ice built up during this 200 years than in the previous 6,000 years. And when the ITCZ shifted northward in 1820 or so, it began sending more warm water into the Gulf Stream, gradually filling the Arctic with channels of deep warm water. This is probably what ended the ice fairs on the Thames and is responsible for the warming we've seen in the Arctic over the past 200 years. How can the Arctic warm so quickly? As that warmer water heads north, it builds up under the ice, which is only a few meters thick. When there's enough heat, it melts the ice over just a few seasons. Remember the Dansgaard Oeschger events I showed earlier? It seems like the Arctic is being warmed by some magical atmospheric effect, when in fact, it's just ice melting and releasing heat that's already in the water, melting yet more ice and cooling the ocean waters below. Around the globe, the ITCZ influences seven major ocean circulations and several minor ones. The largest is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is responsible for the El Nino and La Nina conditions. Do you know whether we're in El Nino or La Nina right now? The El Nino occurs when hot water gets driven west from South America toward Indonesia, causing cold water to move clockwise to North America, creating the cold winters that make for the best ski seasons. In the graph below, we can see the incredible El Nino spike of 1867, which I wrote about in my blog last month. The very hot El Nino years of 1907, 1942, and finally 1998, which was a great year for Al Gore and Greenpeace fundraising. The last El Nino year was 2016. Remember all those claims of hottest year on record? Right now, we're in the La Nina cooler phase of the PDO. This is clearly a cycle, but it's an irregular one. On the Atlantic side, we're in a warm phase. The full cycle lasts about 60 years, which also explains why people were concerned that Arctic ice was melting quickly back in the 1870s and again in the 1920s. The planetary orbit cycle drives the ITCZ cycle, which drives the AMO cycles, which direct the flow of warm water that determines the temperatures in the Arctic. From a magazine editor's point of view, this is a once-in-a-lifetime catastrophe, a crisis that requires tipping points, teams of photographers, and mascots. Magazine editors don't have a very long attention span, so this is big news to them. But from a geologic point of view, this is a cycle that just keeps repeating, courtesy of orbital mechanics.
I'm looking forward to future ski seasons because it turns out that snow is still a thing. And there's more of it, at least in North America. This is driven by the polar vortex, which is the result of complex ocean dynamics and the position of the ITCZ. In the oceans, the Argo floats started measuring temperatures 1,800 meters under the surface in 2004. And so far, they report warming of about 0.04 degrees per decade in less than two decades. That isn't very much. We're only halfway through the current AMO cycle. So we should expect warm waters to continue to flow northward from Africa to the Arctic for another 20 years or so, although the ITCZ is moving south, so that effect will start to diminish. This graph is very important. It's the smoking gun of humans not causing climate change. If you remember the section on emissions, no greenhouse gases can affect ocean temperatures. Infrared coming from the atmosphere can't penetrate the ocean. This shows an increase in thermal energy coming directly from the sun, nothing to do with CO2. What's really driving climate? A lot of people trust NASA. But most NASA employees don't know about a recent NASA paper studying the Earth from a new satellite placed at the Lagrange point between the Earth and the Sun. Thanks to help from Al Gore getting the funding for this satellite, we've learned some very interesting things, and I want to read you their conclusion. Our research supports the idea that clouds and albedo, which ultimately determine the incoming shortwave radiation, are variables of the utmost importance for current climate change in agreement with previous research about the changes in stratocumulus or energy imbalance in the last four decades. Hmm, clouds and albedo are downstream effects of sun and ocean patterns. No mention of CO2 in this paper. Two systems control our climate. The first is based on reflected sunlight that warms the atmosphere via greenhouse gases. The greenhouse effect is huge, but it already happened. Changes from here will be negligible. The second effect is much larger. Sunlight entering the oceans and the transport of heat from the tropics to the poles are on interconnected cycles with various time lags we're just beginning to understand. Nevertheless, I will try to make a few predictions about the future. The IPCC makes predictions. The IPCC uses a lot of models and they average all the model predictions together for purely political reasons. No scientist would average a bunch of models. All the models say we should see a 0.4 degree rise per decade in the tropical troposphere around 30,000 feet above the equator. And yet satellites and weather balloon measurements say no. The average there is only 0.17 degrees per decade, which has probably been going on since 1800 or so. The models all predict higher temperatures should be there right now and they aren't. The models say, just look up and you'll see the smoking gun of humans causing climate change. And when NASA looks up, they don't see it. After 40 plus years and billions of dollars worth of modeling, all we have are scary graphs that don't represent reality. Why do modelers continue to get it so wrong? Why do they keep getting paid to get it so wrong? Because these are the graphs the public wants to see. These are the graphs that get more funding to study the dire emergency. So to make a forecast, I'm gonna predict business as usual, essentially 0.8 degrees in the next 80 to 100 years, no matter what humans do. I'm basing this mostly on the work of Judith Curry, Andy May, John Christie, and others. But I could be wrong. I almost certainly am, because you can't predict the future with much accuracy. So I'll add a 0.8 degree cone of uncertainty, and I'm 95% confident the Earth's average temperature will be in that range. Note that it's very possible to end the century with no change in temperature from today, because temperatures really could go down over the next 20 to 30 years and then head back up. We don't know. For sea level, let's look at data from the tide gauge in Boston. It shows a rise of 30 centimeters in 100 years. However, we know the east coast from New York to Boston is sinking at about 15 centimeters per century. That gives an actual sea level rise of 15 to 20 centimeters per century, which I've shown here in pink. 
Not a single tide gauge in the world shows any acceleration after 1960, when CO2 started to increase. Around the world, all tide gauge graphs look about the same as this one does, a straight line for over 100 years. In my view, this is the most likely true rate of sea level rise for the past 200 years. Judith Curry estimates a true rise of three millimeters per year, which would give us 30 centimeters, one foot, over the next century, regardless of how much CO2 goes into the atmosphere. So we can establish a 95% confidence interval of between 15 and 30 centimeters over the next 100 years. That's about 10 inches of sea level rise by 2120. Now let's look at the next 100,000 years. According to researcher John Parmentola, within the next 500 years, the interglacial period we're in now will end temperatures will begin to descend. The subsequent cold period, which could once again bring an ice sheet down across half of North America, will last about 40,000 years before temperatures begin to head back up. So the next 80,000 years or so are likely to be much cooler than what we're living in today. I think it's entirely likely that cities like Montreal and Boston will be under more than 1,000 meters of ice in 20,000 years. I say that because just 20,000 years ago, Montreal was under three kilometers of ice. Boston was under two kilometers of ice and New York City was under one kilometer of ice. That already happened. The earth is gonna continue on its path around the sun and the best we can do is adapt. We'll probably have time to adapt. The earth tends to cool slowly and warm quickly. In summary, there is no link between CO2 and temperature. Venus and Mars both have atmospheres of 95% carbon dioxide. The surface of Venus is 475 degrees Celsius. The surface of Mars averages around negative 65 degrees Celsius. The difference is the distance from the sun. CO2 is a lagging indicator that has almost no effect on our climate. This is a popular sculpture in Seoul, South Korea. The child is made of ice. They put a new one up in the morning and by afternoon, the child has melted. This is what people want to see. It's emotional and popular and like the temperature graphs and forecast models, it's wrong. No scientist has yet found any concrete evidence that humans are causing global climate to change. According to a McKinsey study, humans will need to spend $275 trillion to decarbonize over the next 30 years. For Americans, that's more than $11,000 per man, woman, and child per year for the next 30 years. It's about $8 trillion a year worldwide, more than 7% of world GDP. In contrast, the World Bank estimates that all of agriculture accounts for 4% of world GDP, and growth in agriculture is two to four times more effective in raising incomes among poor people. And a better economy is better for the environment. This is the climate industrial complex. It's a confusion between correlation and causation that has turned into a massive industry. What's popularly believed isn't always accurate. The truth is we're now safer and enjoy the best quality of life ever on this planet. Things are getting better, not worse. We're living healthier, longer lives than any previous generation. Because of technology and fossil fuels, the environment is also getting better, not worse. And now the people being left behind are those who can't afford electric cars and solar panels. They just want affordable, reliable electricity so they can join the developed world and the middle class. Here are some resources where you can learn more. I hope this has given you a new perspective on climate. The people who need to hear this most are young people. If young people care about the environment, they should learn for themselves what's really going on and what they can do to make a better future for all. Thank you.